This is an heirloom, really, the Japanese keep. It's a very old sword. And when the Japanese die, the very wealthy ones, and they have their ashes, and they put their ashes in these little grooves at the back. We have about seven or eight grooves there. So I, I feel I have seven or eight Japs in the house. So that makes me nervous at times. I was always curious about it because it was in the house. It was always in the house. And we knew there was something special about it because Dad had got it in the war. So we would say to him, oh, Dad, you know, tell us about the war and what happened. And he would say, well, you know, maybe when you're a little bit older or I'll tell you another time, maybe. And we knew not to probe. And then some, later on I asked Mum, you know, did you ever ask Dad about his experiences when you first met him? And, and she said no because, really, you know, he'd been through so much and... He used to have terrible nightmares, and, you know, why bring all that back? 1979, um, he had brain surgery, which they think uh, he got a tumour as a result of all the beatings on his head. And he was told to use his mind and think and just go into his memory. So he did write it all out longhand, and then the book came out. What would you say was the single characteristic that enabled you to survive all of that period? Well, it's a combination, really, of my Irish Catholic heritage, my family background, and lots and lots of luck. Well, it was my father's love growing up in Vera and it was his roots. So even though he traveled the world and was away for so long, his heart was still back here. This was it, you know, it was where his grandfather had started the business and where he had grown up and, you know, home is so important, isn't it? And we saw that all the way through all our travels. This was the place to get back to. This was the Mecca for him. He just adored Bear, and the fact he was one of ten. Yep, five girls and five boys. But it was his memories of growing up and his happiness of learning to swim and being so able in the water that was most important to him. He was sent away to boarding school and he went to Clongo's Woods. So he had a good education, and his interests obviously lay in medicine. So he went to UCC and he studied medicine. I'd say part-time studying medicine, really, considering all the other activities like the swimming and the polo and the general sort of student life, really, that was, that was a big part of his thing as well. He graduated in 1938, and at that time it was pretty difficult to, to get jobs in Ireland. So he went to the UK. And again, jobs weren't particularly easy to get there either. I ran into two more friends of mine who qualified, or two cork chaps, and we had a boisterous evening around the bars of London, finished up in a nightclub sometime the early hours of the morning. And uh, we had by that time decided we were going to join one of the services. And the Navy and the Air Force were the choice between us. And um, we eventually got one of the hostesses to toss up and um, came down on the side of the Air Force. The following morning, three very hungover young doctors arrived down at the Air Ministry to make inquiries. I think they were so glad to see us that we were interviewed, medically examined, and accepted. And we were out in time to have the first drink in the pub's opening at half past 11. As 1939, obviously, war was imminent. 
But I suppose being young and, and foolish, if you like, they thought it was a big adventure. If I see someone that's kind of interested in my dad's, I go over and tell them, well, that's my dad. I'm very proud to tell them. And then um, if they're really interested, I bring down the sword and the medals. It's a weapon no matter what, isn't it? But it's such an important part of my dad's life that it's like part of our family. They actually used to test its sharpness by hold it under a cherry blossom tree, shake the tree, and as the petals fell, they would be cut in half. Then the war started and he was sent to France. And I suppose at that time he thought that that was as far as his war adventure was going to go. We um, got to Boulogne and we weren't very popular because most of our chaps were technicians, fitters, riggers, and we weren't soldier material as such. And so we were much used to the Boulogne people for defending it. started to dive bombers. So we had to scrap our lorries and walk. And we eventually got to the outskirts of Dunkirk where we were formed into a unit and they were marched down the beach. And uh, there your name was put into a sort of a lotto itself. If you pull a high number, you'd be told to go back to the beach and wait. If you get a low number, you'd have to stay. days and three horrible nights there. Because see, we're completely defenseless and we were using just what we could dig into the sand, sort of foxholes, to protect ourselves from the bombing. And a direct hit would, would of course kill us. The whole thing was a, a dreadful experience in that some men were crying, some praying some singing, some completely silent, and everybody terrified. you see, because there was a very shallow beach. You had to wade out really up to your chest very often. And they were pulled on this boat and then brought out to the bigger boat. And quite a number of chaps wounded. Some of them were bullet wounds and not shell wounds. We opened up what I'd been the dining room of the ferry thing, and we started operating and removing. And the first things were removed were, say, our three bullets. They were British bullets. So I can only assume that they were fired by some of our own chaps on our own chaps. This was a photo album which I came across after many months of searching, not that I knew what I was searching for, um, but my mother had always said that somewhere 
in her possessions there was actually a photograph of the man that had given my father the sword. Then I came across this album which just contained so much amazing stuff. This was actually the moment when it all started to make sense that I came across this photograph of a Japanese officer in his uniform with the sword with some inscriptions on the back. We had it translated and it says to my friend Dr McCarthy I give you this um, as a token of my friendship and you know at the outbreak of peace. So I thought that has to be it, that has to be the man. I don't know if it's a long shot but really just hoping that somebody somewhere in Japan knows something to do with that man or his family, really. I mean, it's 68 years later now, so whether that's too long, you know, for, for families to have moved, to have died out, to really not be interested is the other point. So it's kind of a long shot, but we have, by having the photograph, we have at least um, got a face to, to sort of tell people about. <laughs> And if possible, could I get aisle seats, please? Thank you very much. I'm fascinated to find the casinos, to see what the relationship between the two was and to find why he would have given my dad such a special gift. My dad never resented the Japanese after the war, so it'd be fascinating to know what the bond was between these two people. He tried to protect us from all the horrors and the stories, but I think in the back of every child's mind, they want to find out a bit more about what actually happened in their parents' lives. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description.第二次大戦中における日本刀の意味。これは日本刀の本質を突くことになります。で、日本刀は日本人独特の感性から言って終戦時に日本の兵士が連合軍の兵士に刀を渡したことがあるかどうかという合質問ですけれども、原則としては
tow will come in a bit faster in case his undercarriage collapsed. He came in over the perimeter fence, touched down, and realized that um, he was going too fast. And he was going for takeoff again to keep going. And his wingtips caught the top of a bomb dump, which was situated at the end of this runway. And he crashed straight into it. So we got down the runway with an ambulance and a fire tender. The others all, when they saw the bombs scattered around, took off. I don't blame them, because when you're really terrified, I don't think you can really think. And uh, the driver of the fire tender, myself, jumped in, and we found the pilot dead and three of the others alive, so we pulled those out and got them clear. He won the George Medal for pulling five men out of the burning plane. But he did say that, you know, you just act in the moment and you go and do it, and when it's life, that, you know, that's obviously what a doctor does, but maybe it's just a natural instinct. Two newspapers helping us on our search. Oh, crumbs, there he is. <laughs> that's the one. So that's my father. And that's Mr. Casuno, who is the gentleman we're looking for. For 68 years, these people have heard nothing. And then suddenly, to get a picture of your grandfather in the paper, I mean, they're going to get a, a serious shock, I'd imagine. Hopefully a pleasant shock, and hopefully one that they'll respond to positively. But, I mean, yeah, can you imagine just opening the paper and seeing your grandfather there with somebody searching for him after all these years? I mean, you know, I hope it doesn't give them too much of a shock, really. An urgent call came from Help Singapore, so we set off. We were carrying this part of a squadron and a half of Spitfires and Hurricanes in the holes. Got to Singapore, but it was too late. And that's when the next part of his sort of adventure, if you like, started. So they went to Java, then they were sent to Sumatra, and then back to Java again, because the Japanese were kind of closing in on everywhere. When we got to Java, it was a complete shambles, because the Japs were beginning to do landings already in Java.
the Ayajaba was captured by the Japanese and it's in their culture that um, you know you lose face if, if you are captured and that you're just despicable and should be treated thus. He was in a camp in Java for over two years. He was treated very badly. They shouted out, they slapped you and they kicked you and they shot and beheaded several people for not reacting quickly to the thing and if, you, if they any thought of making an escape or... It was terror, terror. They were obsessed about food because their rations were just so meagre, they had nothing. They used to just uh, almost hallucinate about food, but uh, just try and think of meals. And uh, there's one, I think there was a bit of trading done and they got a tin and he thought it was hot dogs, which he kept for Christmas day and it was buried in the corner of a camp. So on Christmas day, when he opened the tin, it was asparagus. And actually he never touched asparagus ever again. Weird creamed off the dirty rice, we strained it, and the maggots we then collected and we boiled those and turned that into a maggot soup, which we gave to the sick. And fortunately, we got a hold of some live yeast cultures, and the chemists, especially the Dutch chemist amongst us, soon got to work, and we were adding that as a, a yeast product to our rice pap, especially to the sick. Most of them were living on our reserves. This was a water bottle that was cut in half. And this is what my dad would have got his um, rice with the and maggot soup in. Amazing how he just thought to bring it back there as well. You think you just want to throw it away. We tried experiments about uh, different types of diets to see if we could cure the beriberi and the various deficiency diseases that were springing up. Of course, there was no penicillin or anything in those days, but when they got shaving foam, he looked at the ingredients and uh, he realised that this could be used to treat certain infections, and he did. My first bad beating was when I was going to where we isolated the distant cases. And normally I had to pass the guards. Guards were sitting inside what would be the front porch. And when I got there, there was no guards, but there was a monkey on a, on a stand beside where the guards had been. So I saluted the monkey, but unfortunately, one of the guards had come back and he saw me and he told the others. I think uh, my dad probably did regret it because he was dragged and kicked and punched and beaten half to death, really. And that's why he had a, a very bad elbow and a tram line of operations. And actually, his arm was so bad even after the beating that they had to remove a cartilage, which was done with no anaesthetic. And he was almost telling them what to do until he actually passed out from the pain. And then, I mean, he was so lucky, you know, not to have got it infected and to have survived it. In 1944, around 1,300 prisoners were transported to Japan in a cargo boat. It was infested with rats. Just about five to midnight, I was sitting up fighting with a rat who got caught in my bit of mosquito netting. I was terrified, and I think the rat was too, but he saved my life. struck by a torpedo from an American submarine. He looked around and uh, nobody else seemed to be getting up. And he realized then that with the steel-hulled ship, the torpedo had actually 
reverberated and broken the necks, whiplash, brakes to everybody that was lying down. So I got up and all the lights had gone out. The water was beginning to come in. I got out about maybe a minute before the ship sank. I swam the best 50 yards of my life. He was in the water for over 12 hours, and they were just hanging on to bits of wreckage, trying to survive. So we were hanging on to wreckage, and you were really discovering people during the night. And then they discovered me, the doctor, and they were shouting for help. And I was doing a surface surgery. I was, was swimming from one bit of wreckage to the other, tying up broken collarbones and trying to splinter broken legs. Eventually, they were actually picked up by a Japanese destroyer. And I suppose because they were covered in oil and dirt and blood and God knows what, the Japanese didn't know who they were picking up, if it was POWs or if it was actually the crew of the Japanese cargo boat. They gave us rice balls to start with. And we were naked, you see. And then I don't know whether they suddenly discovered what we were or who we were. They. Um, started beating us up and throwing us overboard. Some of the chaps were hit and they were not fully conscious. They were being cut in the screws of the propellers. There was an awful lot of red blood. But a bunch of us from the top, we saw what was happening. We dived overboard. The story going at speed is a very difficult thing to get off. But we swam back to our bits of wreckage. We'd been 22 hours in the water then, and we were trying to make up our mind whether we'd stay there or try and get to one of the islands, which were way in the distance. And um, a bunch of about Five or six boats came into view, and there were Japanese whaling boats. And they just started picking everybody else up and um, took us into Nagasaki. So this area in the docks would have been approximately where my father would have disembarked from the fishing or from the whaling boat. Um, I'd say they were very glad to get back onto dry land after so many traumatic days that they'd experienced at sea um, from being a prisoner of war for sort of three years before that. So they were very undernourished. They were mentally and physically damaged, really. Um, then plus the trauma of experiencing all the death and carnage. I mean, of the 780 that were on the transport ship, only 38 made it to Nagasaki. But when the police saw them arriving with the POWs, they didn't really want them in that state. And they told the, the whaling boat to take them back out and dump them at sea. But the whaling boat was so anxious to get home after their long trip that they refused and they left them here. So just up there was actually where the camp was, where they were marched to, and that's where they spent the next year. They were initially put to work in the shipyards where they were building some sort of big Japanese boat. They then were transferred to the Mitsubishi factory, which was metal work. But after their time there, then he was transferred to a coal mine where they were actually working for 10 cigarettes a week. The main beatings I got were in Japan, 
when I was in charge of the camp and I was held responsible for any troop didn't work hard enough or was caught infringing, I also had to get a like because I was responsible for them. There was a lot of brutality and it was a ripple effect with the beatings that if someone did something wrong, it went from the top down, so everybody got beaten anyway. I was just thinking that the wire netting there the, at the top actually makes it still look reminiscent of what you could imagine they would have had in the camp. There's no way across that fence now, just like there wasn't then. But I wonder what the people in the factory thought when they saw the people in the camps outside. Did they really care that they were suffering like they were or just got on and ignored it? I suppose war times these things happen. There's no way that you could ever understand or even feel how we would feel, I'd say. I mean, there's nothing we would have experienced that would have been any way like it. Well, he never really said much to us, really. It was something that was too horrific. He thought his children were too young and vulnerable to know about, really. I suppose it was only when the book came out that we kind of read of the horrors of it. Terrifying, isn't it? Actually being in that situation, you needed something to hang on to, you needed some belief, he needed some hope, you know, it, it was always an escape that he could escape into his faith inside himself. And uh, one day he tried to imagine the shop and the shelves and what was on the shelves and even the people, he tried to bring this back to him and he couldn't and he went into a panic because he thought that his mind was gone then and he could imagine Japanese people actually in the shop. To think that they've taken over your sanctuary it would break your heart. But maybe you realise that you are actually being broken in spirit. あの、で、自分たちの工場や参考鉱山で働かせたんです。あの、3000、あ、えっと、3万6000人が日本に連れてこられました。で、そのうち、あの、10%、3600人ぐらいが日本で亡くなってます。Mr. Smoto, do you have any records of
マッカーシーです。ここは国籍ブリティッシュ。also, we have, um, I found a photograph of Mr. Kasuno. Oh. That was the photograph oh. that he gave to my father uh -huh. when he presented him with a sword. Oh. And that is also dated on September 45. Oh. So we know that they obviously knew each other and that's where he received oh. the sword, that's mm -hmm. the sword we have. Mm. And then I also have this photograph, which was taken in Camp 26. It actually uh, yeah. says ah. Camp 26, uh -huh. and again in September 1945. Oh. So I think that's that's my father there. Uh -huh. uh, ah, yeah. Oh, yeah.建物。いや、そういう感じですね。またこの。ああ、これはイギリス人の。Is Four ah, warrant officers, yes. Royal Navy, British Army, Royal yeah, Navy, ha, ha, ha. Australian, oh. Camp 26 for Kuroka, Kyushu Island, Japan. What do you think about the Kyushu Island? 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 What do you think about there was a bit of trading done at the fences, so they were able to put these crystal radio sets together. So they knew that things were coming, and of course the air raids and the bombings were getting worse and worse. So luckily they were allowed to build a shelter for themselves. As the Japanese were starting to panic and knowing that the inevitable was happening, they got them to dig this big, deep trench. So they were digging away and then they saw a wooden platform being put up at the far end and they realised that they were digging their own grave, a mass grave, and they would just be machine gunned into it. And as he was digging, he said he could actually imagine himself being shot and just lying there, which is just so, so sad. Around about midday, lovely bright August morning, we saw the eight vapor trails in two lots of four. So um, that immediately the rest of us, we shot down for the air raid shelter to get in quickly. Three parachutes came out now with this blinding flash. And we were in the shelter, so we felt the warm air, but nothing more. And then one of the Australians stuck his head out, and it was his plus famous remarks that made us all shoot for the opening lookout. And there was no camp, gone. 
and the day turned to darkness. And you couldn't see any Nagasaki, just things sticking up here and there. And then fires everywhere and smoke and uh, screaming. And then a, a horrible thing started, black rain. This was terrifying. I, I, well, I personally thought it was the end of the world. I mean, it's hard to imagine that within one second, the whole factory, the whole camp, the whole city that's been your prison camp is just raised to the ground. And we all veered then for the mountain to get out because we were in a valley. And down the middle of this valley, there was a river. And some of the chaps got stuck in that, you see, with the mud. And we had an awful job pulling them out. And we were stopping now and again to help people. We suddenly realized that it was useless because one of the chaps pulled some woman and her complete skin came off her face. And um, another chap was trying to help a child and the child's arm came away complete. And the thing was obviously that, you know, that something beyond all, and um, we, kept, we kept running. People who'd been very much injured in the blast and the aftermath, they had caves in the hills which were actually made into small little surgeries. It was a makeshift hospital in the caves, and he went up and just did what he could for prisoners and Japanese. And there was a lot of radiation burns and blindness, so not knowing really what had happened, he just used whatever he could to help these people. But it was quite useless because most of the people who were bringing in were dead. Most of the people treating them were already dying, and we, um, we stayed there then and helped the Japs the best we could with the things, and they were very frightened as we were. We were eventually rounded up by the Japanese thought police, the camp type, and they took us outside Nagasaki and stuck us in a, what I imagine was being a small schoolhouse, and then we had to help cremate bodies. After what he'd been through, he'd been in Java for nearly three years as a prisoner, then transported up to the Japanese mainland, torpedoed on the way up, and then to be in Nagasaki, and the atomic bomb dropped, to be recaptured after all that, when you think you've got freedom, it's terrible. Do you want 
本当にあの水谷あの紹介で、あのえっと、ニコラさんと皆さんを紹介してくださいしてます。はいはいちょっとこれは、えー、1942年の米軍による空軍写真これが全部吉熊炭鉱の原型ですでここの赤く囲んでいるところが収容所When they transferred the prisoners from Nagasaki to here, did they come by train? おそらくそこで降ろされたと思いますそれは結構長い長い長い Yeah. 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 すごい1日以上かかったんじゃないですかね、yeah. これが麻生工業の関係資料なんですけど当時の資料でですねここは第26文書というところなんですねいわゆる敗戦当時ですから10日後ですねだから日本が敗戦8月15日直後までは300人ここにあのいらっしゃるそれで、えー、日本の敗戦後終戦になった時にですね米軍がこのベースキャンプに物資を投下するんです B20 から投下するんですパラシュートで,、ね oh, right. yeah, yeah. でこれが、えー、っと当時の、えー、っと収容所の写真なんですけどお父様が。生き残れられたのは本当にあのラッキーだったと思います。えっとこの写真も、yeah, もうみんな痩せ細ってる。Yeah, 細い。Yeah, right. でこれが日本の配線がもっと伸びてたらおそらく死亡された方もずいぶん増えたんじゃないかと思う We were in the camp and they stopped us work and they started to give us some extra food and、um, they were very nice to us, the Japs guards. And next thing, all the Japs disappeared and they came back in their best uniforms. And they put a radio up in front of the commandant's office on a table and they all assembled. And then this voice came out of the、um, radio and they all bowed. <laughs> The interpreter was standing over the thing, so we asked him what a thing, and he called me a major instead of a number. I was Ichiban, number one. He was crawling, see? So I said, It's over, isn't it? And he said, Yes. And I turned around to the chaps, Let's go and find the commandant. The rest of the prisoners really wanted to tear him apart. But my dad stepped in and just said that they must wait because he realized that help would be coming. So he made sure that、um, the commander of the camp was kept separate. Later, the camp commandant gave the sword to my father. We don't know if it was saving his life or had they built up some kind of friendship. それからこのマッカーシーに対しては「少佐」という言葉を使ってあります。自自分自身には何もまあ、当時としては簡易をつけてない,をつけてないっていうこともちょっとかかります。と、う、も、ん、に何を送るか、まあ、この今回は軍刀だったんですがその軍刀という表現がないということもちょっと私はこの時代背景があって、えー、その書けなかったのでただ選別とともに送るということをあの書かれたんじゃないかなと思いますだから自分の廃業している軍刀を人に与える特に敵に与えるってことは地獄なんです通常は相当お父さんに対して感謝の気持ちがあったんですだから自分も助けられたというよりか日本国民として助けられたことにお礼を言うというのが
この文章から読み取れるという私の感じなんです。Oh, that's interesting. Very interesting. まあ終戦後ですから、えー、平和到来ということを場がありますけれども、戦争が終わった直後、えー、その待ち望んでいた楠野さんの気持ち。That was what both countries wanted at the end to just be able to live normally again and have peace, and so he was looking forward to it as much as my father was as well. Americans flew over the following day and dropped an awful lot of food and clothing and medicines. And then they dropped pamphlets all over the countryside to the Japanese, warning them that they'd be shot if they were caught with even an empty tin of rations or anything. And if they found any of the parachutes, they were to bring them to the nearest camp. And they did. He realized then that、uh, he was the senior officer in the camp and someone had to take charge, so he did, and he just kind of tried to keep things in control and、uh, he issued this order. At 09:15 hours yesterday, the 2nd of September, you cease to be prisoners of war. This camp is now a British military establishment under my command. From the very beginning, I want it to be understood. That the rules and regulations, as laid down by me, together with military discipline, will be maintained. I am now responsible to our government for each one of you. I intend to see to it that you return home safe and sound, and without a cloud of any sort on your military records. J. A. McCarthy, Squadron Leader, Commanding. My dad was very lucky. He survived being a prisoner. He survived the radiation, the brutality, and then he was free at last. It was quite a journey. I started from Japan. They went by ship to San Francisco. Then they went by train across to the east coast of America. By、um, November, I think he managed to get back to Dublin. He came up the docks in Dunleary with plenty of kit bags and the sword, and、um, he was fourteen and a half stone leaving, but seven stone coming home. But my aunt tells me how they went to meet him, and he still had that cheeky smile coming up the gangplank. The most emotional bit was the telegram from my grandmother that she sent to my dad when he arrived back into Dublin, and it just made it full circle as well. It said, "A thousand welcomes from your loving mother." She'd had a stroke in the meantime because she had also lost her at the son, the priest, in the last bomb that was dropped on London during the war. It was like she just hung on for him. She died on Christmas Eve that year. Got the OB and the Pacific Service stars, and then he got a papal award as well. He became a Knight of Saint Sylvester. I think it's just for goodness you have done, and I think his bravery was realised even in the spiritual side. はい。
えもしあのー、あれでしたらぜひともニコラさんの方であの刀の持ち主だったそのクスノケにあの会いたいということなんですけれども。その祖父のお墓がですね。はい。北九州の若松というところにあるんですよ。えー、その辺でお話をするというのが、ああ、そうですね。じゃあいいんじゃないかみたいなことはちょっと言ってたんですね。I'm Nikki McCarthy.、Ah, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. And he's、And、Satoshi Kusuno. Kusuno, yes, your grandson of. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. And、uh, his mother, Michiko. Yes. Oh. Younger sister. Absolutely. Younger sister. Oh, lovely. Kaori. Glad that we found you.、Yes. そういうところを、はい、見せてお越しくださいました。ああ、ですああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。Did you see? Oh, excuse me. Did you see that was the photograph with the inscription? Yes. Yeah. すごくこう大切にこう取っておいていただいているのが普通もう焼けちゃうんですけどね。きれいにあの大事にしていただいたというのがわかります。I was just going to say, how did you feel when you saw the article in the paper asking for us or telling, you know, looking for contact? ちょっとあのまあやっぱり単純に驚いているというところ。あの時代というのはその日本は当然負けた国ですから、うん、その辺りは聞いてもないしその持ってたことも当然私たちはあの分からなかったんですね。Oh, you didn't know. All right. で多分そういった事柄は全てみんなそのままお墓の中に一緒に持っていってるんだと思うんですね。Yeah, my father was the same that he didn't talk about it.、Um, you know, that's why... It's taken us this long to meet you. Then, so to do. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, that's beautiful photograph, isn't it? So it must have been a very sad occasion as well. And after the war, did your grandfather stay in the military, or did he leave the military? Yeah, so it was. So, yes, ne, 普通の仕事に。あのなんかなあの当時でいうと高校の先生したのはいつだったの？戦後かな。戦後,戦後はあの工業高校のあの先生をしたりですね。We heard a possibility that、um, in the camp in Kaysen there were I think it was 197 Australians and just fewer of the、um, Allied forces and that after Japan surrendered. That the Australians were very keen to kill as many Japanese officers as they could, and that my father had taken your grandfather and locked him in a shed or in an office, and he wouldn't let the Australians get to him to kill him, and that it was because of that he had given the sword, but you didn't hear anything. Ah, その殺そうとしたところをその助けていただいたという話を聞いて非常に感激してます。あのその後の人生いろんなこう変化があったかもしれないしその流れでいくと私もいなかったかもしれないからですねだからそういうふうにあのあおっしゃっていただいた助けていただいたということに非常にあの感謝しております。What we would like to do is to ask you if you would like to see the sword again you'd be very welcome to come to Ireland any time to come and see any of your family. あのお伺いしてみたいことはあの行ってみたいですねアイルランドのその国自体も割と憧れてる国ですから。Thank you very much and thank you and it's been an honour an honour and as I say I must give you the address now in Ireland and you can come over and bring the family with you. It'd be an honour to see you there.
黙とう It's very hard to believe that it actually happened, that any of it happened, let alone to my father. You know, in relatively recent times, I mean, it's still in so many people's memories to think such barbarism. And it probably sure it still goes on today, and people will be telling the same story in years to come. But it was always very difficult when he was alive to actually believe, really, that he'd been through that and to come out relatively unscathed. And I, I know it's a different generation, and I know time moves on, but it was still three and a half years of my dad's life, and um, and I think I suppose just the fact that you no, know, really, mankind hasn't learnt from that. You know, that's a sad thing as well. It's still going on in different parts of the world now. I think that's why the sword was something important to him. It was a sign of humanity. One day, he was sitting on the lounge watching television, and I was pottering around. And when I went in, I saw his hand hanging by the stairs, out by the side of the, the chair, and to find he had a very bad stroke, very bad stroke. He had done an interview for RT, and they said, oh, it'll be on at some future date. And he said, oh, they've forgotten about me, that'll never be on. And then the day that he actually got a stroke in England and got sick, uh, they rang to say, oh, that's going to be on, you know, in a week's time. And my mum said, well, I can't talk now because he's just going off in the ambulance. And they said, oh, oh, you know, we'll cancel it. And we said, no, no, you know, it's, we'd love it to be on and it'll be great. And I stayed with him all night long. And during the night, the doctor called me and he said, you know, uh, it's sad news, you know, it's very little hope. And he, I said, will I ring Ireland? And he said, yes, ring them. And I rang home here, and he came home with me. And then next day, that, that was it. Mm. So he passed away within 24 hours. And then uh, we brought his body back to Castletown. His roots and his heart were here. And uh, the day that he was buried, the programme was on the radio. So people were down in the hotel. And then it was like my dad had the final word and people just stood up and applauded at the end of it. And it was just amazing. What would you say was the single characteristic that enabled you to survive all of that period? Well, it's a combination, really, of, of my Irish Catholic heritage, my family background, and lots and lots of luck. <laughs>